thanks a lot for the trailer and uh, thanks to all of you who made it to today's um, GDTA Spotlight session. A warm welcome from Potsdam, Germany uh, and literally speaking, uh, it's sunny, it's bright here. Uh, so therefore uh, it is uh, literally also a warm welcome. A warm welcome from my side, um, Dr. Claudia Nicolai. I am the co-director of the HBID school and due to a personal emergency, the GDTA president and also my beloved colleague, uh, Professor Uli Weinberg, can't make it for today to start that session. Uh, hopefully he might join us a bit later, but he also sends uh, his best greetings. And we are all looking forward to an interesting hour all together uh, with this GDTA Spotlight. And uh, with that, um, we can directly jump to the agenda in terms of uh, letting you know how that hour will look like. Um, it will be a shorter welcome, so therefore the presenters will have more time and also you have more time with them to discuss the most recent findings. Because me personally, I'm really looking forward to that session together with um, our colleagues, um, um, Professor Dr. Falk Übernickel and Dr. Daniele Di Paula, to learn more about their like recent work uh, and published also in that study. Uh, and they're going to talk about also what types of learning they figured out and have um, been discovering all together by trying to understand um, the, the status quo of design thinking from a researcher's but also from a practitioner's perspective. And for those of you uh, who don't know them well, so, has, um, so Falk is a full professor here at the Hasse Plattner Institute uh, and does um, research um, on design thinking, innovation, digital transformation. Uh, and um, besides that, um, for those uh, of you who doesn't know that, he also has been uh, the co-founder of the so-called Sugar Network in terms of also applying user-centered, human-centered design thinking principles to um, um, software engineering and other business problems. And uh, with uh, Danieli, uh, we have uh, one of his team members also at that chair, um, Dr. Danieli Di Paula, uh, who is this, one of the senior researchers um, at Falk's department, uh, who also has been um, like directing her PhD on that topic, how design thinking has been used and implemented within organizations. So with those two people, we have really the specialists um, uh, uh, about this topic. And uh, we are really looking forward um, to your talk, uh, to your presentation. For that, you have approximately half an hour, plus minus a few minutes, depending on you. Uh, and then we all together have um, 20 minutes plus minus uh, for our Q&A, uh, so that at 4 p.m. we're going to stop the recording and uh, also kind of um, uh, end this official part. And then for everyone who'd like to hang out a little bit longer with us and in particular our speakers is more than invited to do so for the informal part. And with that, um, before I hand over to both, to Falk and Danieli, uh, I, because I now have your undistorted attention, I'd like to draw also your attention already to some activities we are also planning together with the GDTA, the Global Design Thinking Alliance, the HPI, uh, the D School uh, here in Potsdam, but also the D School in Cape Town, because um, it's going to be uh, an anniversary that we can celebrate uh, 15 years of design thinking at HPI within our network. And for that, uh, we already want to kind of um, do a pre uh, shout out to you in terms of letting you know that there's going to be a two days conference as a hybrid event on site in Potsdam and online on September 15th and 16th then followed by an international global activity as a design thinking challenge and ended by um, the opening um, ceremony and also the already hopefully well-known Decon Festival at uh, the new D School building in Cape Town. So that will happen also as a hybrid on event on site online mid of October 12th till 14th of October. So keep those dates in the back of your heads. But now we'd love to shift back to the recent activities and the recent research um, 
on uh, design thinking. And with that, uh, everybody who has their camera on, you can raise your hands and give a virtual clap to Feig and Danieli. And for the ones who don't have that, you have that, but exactly, Luisa is leading my example. Give them a virtual clap with your hands. <laughs> Wonderful, Claudia. Thank you very much for this kind introduction also to Stephanie and welcome everyone um, on the globe. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. It's great to see you uh, here in that space. And before we, we look at the study and introduce ourselves, um, please feel free as part of the talk to interrupt us to um, give you comments in the chat. Um, I think Stephanie, Claudia, help us also to collect your feedback. And if it's, uh, if it's an appropriate point in time here in this talk, we will stop and also answer your questions in between uh, because sometimes it's good to have the drawing in front of you instead of waiting with the question until the end. So please feel encouraged um, to ask the question. Nevertheless, we will also have a look at the time so that we cover most of the stuff uh, as part of this talk. So um, it will be a balance um, and it's based on, on your performance as well. So um, maybe let's start sharing our slides and uh, Daniele will be uh, in the lead for switching back and forth uh, the slides. And as you can imagine, that's always a hassle if two or three are presenting. Um, and maybe let's uh, have a brief look at who we are and uh, who has done the study. And uh, Claudia also gave already some, some infos about us, but uh, maybe let's start with myself briefly. Falk is my name. I'm here at HBI since 2019, and I'm doing research and also practicing design thinking since the mid of the 2000s, uh, so quite a bit of time. And um, yeah, uh, so that's about me. Daniele, maybe you want to move on? Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Daniele. Uh, as Claudia introduced me, I'm a senior researcher at the chair of Design Thinking and Innovation Research, the chair of Professor Uber Nico. Um, I started doing research about design thinking when I was still doing my master's degree, so back in 2013. So it has been quite some time already that I have been looking into how to use design thinking in organizations, how to implement, how to measure, what kind of process and tools to use it. And I'm very happy to be here with you today to share our learnings from our recent study. Yeah, and together with us, and basically the main author of the study is Stephanie. Um, I'm not sure if she's here in the room or not, but uh, since she is also working full time as a consultant, she um, might not make it now. But I would like to mention her as well because she was sitting in the driver's seat for the entire study time. And she did a great job, at least from my perspective. I hope you agree after the presentation as well. And um, she used to work at the D School for a very long time in several positions and is now working for a consultancy and therefore being quite busy now. Uh, apart from Steffi, Daniele and myself, I also would like to say thank you to Ella Wolf. She was uh, basically creating the analytical framework of the study, Roman Reinhardt who did the data analysis, uh, Christina Fuchs, who went, looked into the literature. And then we had a fabulous uh, D-School team with Anja Hanisch and Tim Hönig, uh, who helped us with the layout of this beautiful work. And then Paul Grabowski um, did the drawings. So that's enough uh, of appreciation, uh, but you see it's a, it's a big group who, who did the work. So what are we talking about? Um, and maybe we can have a look at the next slide here. It's basically this study here. Um, so it's not just a PDF, but it's a real physical version of a study. And at the end, you will also learn how to get a physical uh, copy. So how did this all start it? And the basic idea for uh, doing studies on design thinking was basically not uh, uh, coming from us as an author team, but uh, from our colleagues who did already a really good study in 2016. Um, so Jan Schmidtgen, Holger Rino, uh, and uh, yeah, Mrs. Köppen. Um, so they, they basically did a first study and you know it most probably, it's um, yeah, parts without a hole. And we thought in uh, the year 2000, at the beginning of 2000, mm, maybe it's time 
to do something similar again. And uh, let's try to replicate most of the question in order to learn where design thinking is currently positioned in the market. And that was, uh, yeah, the, the time when the study was born. And uh, we then came together as a team of researchers with different master's students and, and PhD students and said, okay, let's do it. And uh, the process was then uh, quite complicated, so to say, um, because it was not um, as easy as we thought, because in the beginning we thought, okay, let's just do replicate all the questions. But then uh, we got a lot of feedback on, okay, why not investigating more topics than uh, they were covered in the previous study? So we said, yes, let's, let's look for new stuff as well. And therefore we decided to uh, on, on a four-step approach. <clears throat> on one hand side, we started with this, um, with, with a global survey. So we sent out a questionnaire, mainly based on questions that were covered in the first study already. And uh, we reached out to, in total, uh, 600 people, a bit more than 600 people. And we collected from the entire globe uh, data about uh, the implementation in organizations. In addition to that, we also reached out to um, experts in the field as part of uh, interviews. And we collected uh, different data points. And most of the interviews, they um, took roughly one hour, sometimes a bit more time. And they uh, provided us uh, with new insights on how design thing has been used, but also uh, we used the interviews to confirm some of our data and, and, and finding. And then in a third step, um, Daniele and I were offering last year a course on OpenHBI about managing design thinking uh, in organizations. And as part of this course, we also invited a lot of participants uh, to take part in a salary study because um, so far it is mainly unknown what the salary structure looks like for uh, design thinking advocates in organizations. And through that part of the study, um, we were able to uh, find at least some evidence um, how that structure looks like. And then um, the fourth step is basically the final analysis that we have done uh, all together as scientists to look across all the data points that we have collected. And we compiled this, as I said, um, in this nice study. So what was our uh, guiding framework? Uh, the guiding framework uh, was basically invented and come up with in 2019s already by Ella. Um, Ella used to be a master student in my team as well. And uh, the, uh, this framework helped us to, to build up the questionnaire and helped us to, to ask uh, hopefully all the questions that are needed to ask in order to learn where design thinking is. And we came up with these dimensions. So it's strategy. Um, we asked question about training and development uh, inside organizations, also about the anch organizational anchoring and where design thinking is applied. Um, we ask a lot of questions about the team itself, as well as the process, tools, and mindset. And then we also wanted to know about the culture and leadership style, impact and measurement, and, and the salary structure as I said. So, uh, so this is basically uh, the setup. And yeah, let's look into to the details. Um, the slides are basically organized along this, um, uh, this, this analytical framework. And I'm now handing over to Daniele to cover the first part. Thank you, Paul. So today we'll be sharing some findings from each one of the chapters that you see here in the design thinking implementation wheel. So then as you can see here, the first one is strategy. So let's have a look at what we found when we were looking to the topic of strategy. Um, as you probably know, design thinking is defined in many different ways. So depending on with whom you talk, uh, the person will give you a completely different definition of what design thinking is. And coming from that perspective, we wanted to know what is design thinking understanding for our sample. 
So we, are, we had one question in our interviews guideline and also in our surveys, what is design thinking for you and what is design thinking for your company? We really wanted to understand whether there was an alignment between what they, what our sample, our respondents were saying and what academia was saying. And we also wanted to compare what they were saying with the sample they responded from 2015 was saying. And then we analyzed all the qualitative data provided by our respondents, and we were able to match the understanding that they gave us with the definitions that we found in academia. So you have probably seen already that design thinking has been defined as, as an approach to create artifacts, so as a toolbox. Design thinking can also be uh, defined as a problem solving activity coming from the perspective of the process and methods. And it can also be seen as a reflective practice. So by following this um, academic approach, we then map the, the understandings of our interviewees with what we found in the literature. And see, here you can see some of the quotes that came from our interviewees and from our respondents in the book. You can see some more quotes as well. And this is, was our starting point because based on the understanding of that our interviewees and our respondents had, we were able to derive some interesting insights from other questions that we had. So for example, what is the connection between how, how our respondents see design thinking with the strategic intent that the company had when they started to implement design thinking? So companies, they implement design thinking for many different reasons with many different strategies. And we wanted to understand what, are, what is the connection between definition and strategic intent. So if you look here on the right-hand side, you will see a Venn diagram with some different strategies that we had in our study. So we looked, we, we asked our participants what, what strategy they use, what is the underlying strategic intent when implementing design thinking, and they could answer either transformational, adjacent, core business strategy, or a combination of different strategic approaches. So they could also answer transformational and core, or transformational and adjacent, or the three strategies. And by using these answers together with the definition, we were able to have an understanding of how exactly to find some patterns depending on the strategy. So for example, interesting patterns that we found was that most companies that implement design thinking with a transformational strategy, they see design thinking as a mindset. So most of the responders and most of the interviewers they said design thinking is not just a tool, it's not just a method, design thinking is really the way that you think in a more exploratory way. And this was very clear from the data. And for example, if you look at adjacent market strategy, then most of the respondents and most of the interviewees, they also see design thinking more as a method, whereas the, for the core business strategy, they see design thinking more as a tool. And then when we look at the combination of different strategies, so for example, uh, uh, companies that use design thinking for with a transformational strategy and also core business a strategy they see design thinking more as an enablement approach. So basically as an approach to help the teams um, to explore a certain topic, to enable the team to achieve something. Um, for the companies that follow an adjustment and core business strategy, they, they see more design thinking more as a data-driven approach. So they see design thinking as a way to collect data from, um, from users, from customers, from internal processes, collect data from a, about, about a particular phenomenon and make decisions based on this data. So it's more about data collection. And companies that use design thinking as a transformational and adjacent is more this exploratory approach. Okay, let's explore what, what we could do in terms of business models, Let's explore what we could, what, what kind of new needs we could tackle. Let's explore different uh, opportunity areas. And that's more how they see design thinking. There are also companies that use design thinking for the three different strategies. And in this case, design thinking was strategically tailored, as you can imagine. So our respondents, they were very clear when they said, 
in different parts of the organization, there are different needs. And then we implement it in different ways according to the needs. For the teams that is more ahead of transformational initiatives, transformational efforts, they see it and implement it in, in this way. And the team who is more in our core business, they see it and implement it more as a tool, more tailored to what the, the needs are at a particular moment. So this is how we started with the study. And we also look in the chapter of strategy, we also look at what, why companies stop user design thinking, why they discontinue. And here I bring five reasons that were most mentioned in our study. So the reasons are from our study are in blue and the reasons from the 2015 study are in orange. So here you can see some interesting insights. So we can learn some interesting things here, for example, um, in 2015, one reason for this continuation was that design thinking was seen as a one-off affair. That was the number one reason. So basically companies, they would have design thinking workshops or they would have one particular project and they, that would be it. There would not be a continuation or a strategy or a plan that to employ to implement design thinking more long-term. And this was the main reason in 2015. When we look at the, our data now, this one off of a reason went down to number five. So this was the fifth reason that we found. And the number one was the wrong understanding about what benefits design thinking brings. So companies did now understand that design thinking brings benefits, but they are not completely sure how exactly to implement it and how exactly to enable these benefits from happening. So they hear stories, they hear successful stories from all over the world, but companies are still struggling to understand exactly how to enable these benefits. If you go for, if we go to this num number two reason, so in 2015, um, there was a lack of management support. So there was, and this lack of management support came down for no, position number three in our study. And in our study, position number two now is nobody's in charge of pushing design thinking on a team level. So our respondents, they mentioned several times that it's important to have someone as a champion to really push design thinking on the ground. So besides having management support, it's also important to have this person on the ground who really push and enable teams to develop a mindset or to understand how to navigate the uncertainty and ambiguity that it comes with the process. And then number three, as I said, was lack of management support. Number four is lack of in-house capacity. And number five, as I mentioned, was designing think as a one-off affair. So from this data, it's possible to derive some interesting insights. So for example, in, in the previous study, um, it was evident that the challenges that were um, hindering companies in actually implement design thinking was whether they should actually do it. Should we do it or not? Question mark. And now with our data, we see that there is a common understanding that it brings benefit. And the question now is how to do it properly. What is the ideal way for my company, for my organization, for my environment to implement design thinking? And our study is a call for more experts in the area who, not, who understand this design thinking in the context of how to tailor the, the practices, the tools, the mindset to that particular context of the organization. And now I hand over to Falk, who will talk about the findings of the training and development chapter. Exactly. So one of the questions that uh, were interesting to us was um, how many employees in an organization have heard about design thinking and how many are uh, using it? Because uh, this seemed to be highly relevant for people who are setting up uh, in-house uh, training programs in order to learn how many people do we need to train. And uh, as part of the study, we differentiated into different um, organizational sizes. Uh, so they're indicated by the color. So dark blue means uh, larger organizations and the kind of greenish uh, colors 
are small scale um, organizations. And on the X axis, you see the percentage of employees who have heard about design thinking as an estimate, and then the um, the proportion is uh, depicted on the Y axis. And uh, the uh, the data. Uh, the median is uh, flagged with an M uh, for each uh, company size individually. And what you can learn from that graphic is that in uh, small organizations, um, more than 70% of people, so like startups, more than 70% of the employees have heard about design thinking. So they had a kind of rough or have a kind of rough understanding or even a basic training in uh, design thinking. While in large organizations, um, uh, only up to 30% uh, have knowledge um, on what design thinking is, is, is all about. So that gives a first rough estimate on um, how much design thinking is already spread um, across the different uh, kinds of organizations. It becomes even more interesting if we go one chart further um, that shows basically how many employees are using design thinking as part of their daily or weekly work routines. And as you see, there is a big shift from, uh, from the percentage from the right to the left. And especially if you look to medium and large size organizations, uh, which is still interesting and a big number, uh, so to say, that roughly 10% of employees are basically using this kind of approach uh, on a regular base. Um, if you look at, at startups and smaller companies, it's a bit higher, uh, somewhere between 20 and 30%, but in large organizations, it's uh, up to 10. So imagine you're working for a large car manufacturer with 100,000 employees that still makes up to 10,000. Um, so therefore, it's a kind of interesting number to, to know um, especially if you set up internal training and development programs, because uh, we are still talking uh, about a fairly large number of uh, people who needs to get training so that they can use it on a daily um, uh, base. So if you look to uh, the next chart, um, here you can learn how much time it needs to become an expert. And basically what you see on the y-axis is the level of expertise that you have. Uh, and this was measured by a self-assessment. So um, the participants of the survey were asked how they estimate themselves, either as a beginner or intermediate, advanced or an expert. And then later in the same uh, questionnaire, we asked the participants how much experience they have in years. And um, as you clearly see, there is a, a path going from the lower left corner to the upper right that basically says, um, as a beginner, uh, you're clearly uh, in a one year range of experience, but to become an expert uh, or an advanced person, you need to have at least three to five years for an advanced um, skill set or even if you want to become an expert, on average, you need to have uh, six to 10 years of experience in order to call yourself an expert. And this is interesting as well for um, yeah, scaling up an organization because it basically tells you that it takes time, right? Um, so it's not just something that you learn in a, in a, in a video workshop, um, basically, but it requires a lot of, um, uh, practical experience in the field to, to become an expert or an advanced person in, in design thinking. And uh, this hopefully tells also uh, training experts in organizations um, and even HR people uh, more about who to hire uh, if you want to start quickly with, with, with design thinking in organizations. So, uh, since we are constrained in time, uh, at least what I learned from Claudia, maybe let's move on to the next slide um, because that shows basically the organization anchoring and the error of application. And the uh, greenish um, chart is uh, showing the year of 2021. And then we also asked the participants how it will look in the future. And we asked for different departments where design thinking has been used. And for sure in the top, 
uh, it starts with R and D. And as you clearly see, um, there is even an expansion plan of design thinking in these kinds of knowledge intense uh, departments. So from 56 to 64, uh, but it basically is already very much established in R&D departments. But if you look at the bigger discrepancies between 21 and 23, then you immediately see IT departments, marketing, say it's OR, uh, OM, and finance and accounting um, getting highlighted. And let me just focus on some of the, the larger ones. So like IT, um, because uh, digitization, digitalization is becoming more and more relevant in organizations. Uh, this also puts a new pressure on IT departments to move away from just uh, maintaining existing systems uh, into a operational mode that also helps business departments to drive for innovation. And therefore, IT departments need to and will invest more into design thinking methodology in order to work together with the business department on new radical and human-centered solutions. Uh, the same counts for marketing and sales uh, because uh, it, it doesn't say that the tools of marketing are not, not valid anymore, but um, what these people have realized is that um, tools from design thinking like a customer journeys, persona, uh, just help them radically to uh, pinpoint in a better way uh, specific market needs of users and customers. And therefore, uh, we will see um, a dramatic uprise of uh, the use of design thinking in these departments. You might wonder about the operations and manufacturing departments. Uh, I was wondering too, but um, uh, just as a side story, uh, we also collaborated last year with BMW in exactly that um, area of innovation. And what um, most of the participants in that um, uh, industry said that uh, they, they need to re-innovate how things are getting produced in the future. And uh, that also indicates this huge um, increase, large increase in the use of design thinking methodology soon. So now I'm handing back to Daniele uh, because she will then uh, start talking about uh, Teams. Yes, so Teams was also one chapter of our book. And what we wanted to understand was uh, what kind of characteristics um, is, is considered when forming a design thinking team. And research on how to compose teams date back to decades. There is nothing, um, there is a lot of studies already on how to compose teams. And we use our data, we use our findings to compare with what academia was saying. And we asked several questions to our participants and the findings that we had was that an ideal size is less than 10 individuals. So from all the responses that we got, the, the respondents, they said, uh, ideal size is five, is six, is seven. We didn't get any answer with above 10. So all the answers that we had in our study was less than 10 individuals. And when looking at academic studies on team composition, it shows very clearly that this is normally the good uh, size because the more people you have on your team, the more coordination is necessary. So to achieve this ideal size of the team, Academic, academic studies and also our findings show that in the context of design thinking, um, less than 10 individuals is the idea. We also look at what kind of expertise is considered, is present in a design thinking team. And our respondents mentioned design, IT, business, and also design thinking experts. And there is one expertise that it's on the rise that was, was mentioned a few times as well, was psychology. So psycho our respondents mentioned that psychology is, is also important to have in a design thinking team because psychologists, they are able to look at the user in a more cognitive view. And this helps the teams a lot to understand how to better create solutions for that particular user. So 
the area of expertise of psychology seems to be on the rise for design and thinking teams, according to our findings. Uh, regarding personality traits, we saw as being relevant characteristics, being social, being open, being reflective, uh, being able to work in a team as well. So not much uh, ego-driven or individual, individualistic-driven traits, but more like teamwork and being social, open and reflective. This was the three dimensions that we identified as being relevant when composing teams. When we look a little bit deeper into the expertise bubble, uh, there was also uh, some interviewees and some respondents who mentioned that about the role of the design thinking coach. It was very interesting to see that many, many respondents mentioned that the design thinking coach should not play a role of moderating um, the work of the team, but the design thinking coach should be part of the team in the sense of contributing to one specific expertise. So expertise regarding um, sustainability, digitalization, design, business. So they see, we, we got many responses in this direction and that's why we, we emphasize this here, that the role of the coach should be more than um, teaching other people how to, teaching the team how to navigate the process, but, but instead being really integrated in the team and um, contributing with other expertises as well. And there was other responses as well that was very interesting. They brought the question mark of whether does it really make sense to, have to compose design thinking teams or should we just become, should the companies just become a design driven organization? Many of our respondents mentioned that design thinking is too powerful to be only in the hands of a team. So design thinking should really be implemented on several areas of the organization and should be understood by several employees. That this concept, this notion of having a design thinking team and the team will have provide support to other parts of the organization. Our respondents questioned that approach and they were more in the, they were, they were suggesting the direction of instead of having teams, really investing on having this shared understanding, this common understanding of the benefits that design thinking brings for that particular context. As I mentioned in the beginning, different parts of the organization, they might have different strategies and they might need a different way of doing design thinking. But this was a very interesting finding from our study as well. Um, and the next chapter was about process tools and mindset. So we ask our respondents, how exactly do they implement design thinking? Is it more as a process or is it more as a holistic approach? And by holistic approach, we mean as a, as a tool, as a process, as a mindset. So not just a process that you follow, but have really having this, um, this mindset of how and when to implement this anything. Yeah. And this was the result of our findings. So as you can see, the large organizations, most of them, they implement design thinking as a process. While the, the micro organizations, they implement it more as a holistic approach. And here goes a little bit of interpretation and, and also some of the responses that we got that it seems to be very difficult to spread design thinking in a more holistic way when the large organizations, they have more rigid approaches, they have more rigid structures. While in micro organizations, it's more flexible how design thinking is spread. And this was a very interesting finding as well. And then we, we also ask our respondents how often do they involve users in co-creative innovation processes and how is design thinking implemented? So basically we got the answers from this graph on the left-hand side and we put into perspective with the question of how department involve users in the innovation processes. 
So here, you, the yellow line is the holistic approach and the blue line is the process. As you can see, the frequency of users involved methods is higher when we have a holistic approach to be implemented in the organization as compared to B2 process. And then we have the next chapter of cultural leadership and communication. And when we ask what are the leadership essentials for design thinking? So what kind of characteristics leaders should have? And these are the, the data that we got. So the answers, it was multiple choices. So they respond, the most voted answer was that the leader should have purpose and value driven, should be able to provide feedback in a constructive and intelligent way, should also be critical, and leaders should care about the employees. They should, be, they should empower the teams, they should enable the, the teams to follow what they are learning from the data. They should, the leader should also be trusting, explorative and playful, and finally creative. So it's very interesting to see how purpose and value driven is on the top as being a preferred leadership trait for design thinking. And then we also ask, how is leadership supporting the implementation of design thinking at the organization? And here you can see answers ranging from no support at all, to high leadership support. So the answers, they are, very, um, they are very distributed with most of the answers ranging here in the middle. So there is a, a bigger, there is a, a considerable management support, but it seems that more management support is even needed to make design thinking happen. And we also had questions in our study about looking into the future. So then we asked the participants in 2023, what would be the impact of design thinking on the organizational culture? And the answers range from no impact at all to very high impact. And the, the answer most voted was number four, so high impact. So this shows that our participants see that the benefit of design thinking will continue in the next years. It will not just be limited to the present. And since we are talking about impact, let's have a quick look at the impact and measurement chapter. So here I must say that the chapter was written by Dr. Dr. Martin Schwimler from the HBID school and by Selena Meyer from HBI Academy. So here we have a list of how design thinking impacts the organization and in comparison to the 2015 study. So for example, items like design thinking makes our innovation process more efficient, design thinking improves the working culture. And one very interesting one is design thinking helps us save costs. As you can see, there is an interesting increase here in the answers when we compare the two studies, the two results. And here on the left-hand side, you see the most, um, the, some of the most relevant insights. So make innovation processes more efficient, improving working culture and helping to integrate users more frequently. And now I hand over back to Falk, who will talk about our last chapter, so salary. Yeah, exactly. So salary uh, was not asked in the previous study, and therefore we were really happy to collect such data. Uh, on this chart, you see a differentiation by industry sector and then the average salary. So it's not differentiated here by gender. So it's uh, all mixed together. As you clearly see um, in the manufacturing industry, the um, salary itself is the highest one. Um, in comparison to financial services, other service industries, um, and the lowest is uh, information and communication um, industry with roughly 76, 75,000 uh, uh, US dollars per year. Um, among many other charts, we then also did a split down and maybe we can have quick, 
look at the chart here and ask by expertise. Um, that might be interesting to you as well. So how much does every uh, expertise level um, earn? And the average salary for a beginner uh, in its first year or with a one year experience is roughly 75,000 US dollar. And it goes up to an expert level with, with 97,000. For sure, the spread on an expert level is much higher. So uh, we even saw a very high salary um, uh, for experts being paid, but uh, the average is roughly 100,000 um, K that you can get out of the, the, the job basically. Um, we don't have a chart for this, but we also tried to figure out if there's a big difference between male and female. And uh, to be honest, um, our data indicate that there is a, a difference. Um, I'm not sure if it's big or not, but it's considerable um, with uh, female earning less than, than male. Um, and from my personal standpoint as a male, I would say the gap is big. Um, and it's significant. So uh, this is definitely something you can read in a report as well, and then you can make your own uh, sense out of it. But that's definitely something that we all need to work on it um, to, um, yeah, to, to uh, bring the salaries on the same level for the same um, level of work quality. Um, what we also ask as part of the study is uh, that the salary differences on your based on your qualification level. So if you have a non-academic degree, bachelor, master, or doctorate. Um, so this you can also find in the report. So speaking about the report, how do you get a copy? Um, Daniel was already showing a, a slide for it. So scan that QR code and the first uh, 20 participants who register uh, on Google Forms uh, will get a free copy of uh, this report. For all the others, uh, we will send you a link. It's also not that expensive. The university print of the uh, University of Potsdam is publishing it and uh, they can also send you uh, a copy uh, uh to your home address so that's basically it and um i just want to say thank you again uh to my co-author fellows to everyone who contributed to claudia for sure to uh, uli i see that you joined already um as you can imagine he was not just an intellectual support but also a big fan of of just doing it so Together with Claudia, they they immediately said yes. Let's let's do it. So thank you on this um, on, on here in in this space. So yeah, that's it. And I'm or we are now looking forward to uh, see your questions. Yeah, first of all, thank you, um, everybody who also would like to actively join uh, the discussion. You can also. Uh, maybe not only, I mean, um, like do this, uh, but also do this uh, in terms of by having turned on your camera first, uh, because we also would like to um, see the people with, with whom we're discussing. First of all, also big thanks from my or our side um, to Falk and Danieli uh, to uh, having shared uh, and really condensed, I mean, um, I would say, the massive amount of findings um, that you presented also in the book. And uh, I really like the way how you, you brought it all together. Specifically also highlighting that even though, I mean, we could have expected that, that as it's somehow a follow-up study, somehow means that you also have created a, a completely new research design. The findings for me uh, are indicating if you look also at the different factors or like chapters or topics that you have been looking at, um, that design thinking became far more than a process or a toolbox that you can apply. And uh, I just want to like, um, 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 like quote a bit, like also one of the metaphors or analogies you picked when it um, in the in, in the study uh, in terms of describing um, um, the training program, saying that no, you can learn a recipe uh, from somebody by just no, getting the ingredient list and a short description how to prepare it. But at the end, um, um, when you think now about this as being the beginner's level that lots of people also had five years ago, um, the advanced level is being able to design 
cooking classes for completely different groups of people. And that's actually what we now see uh, within um, design thinking also as a range from applying it um, at that toolbox set then to also if we now look uh, into the other findings, um, making use of it as a more holistic concept, as a concept that also applies. And I think that's also something to be highlighted, not only to problems that um, organizations do address that are somehow external, meaning creating something new for customers, for clients, but also applying that, for example, to manufacturing and operational processes where so it's like, we'd like to use this mindset in order to also innovate our internal standard operating procedures. And uh, for that, um, I'm really like, um, I'm really, I mean, grateful, like, like, li like really like lining that out. And some other people already started um, putting in a, a few questions. And uh, therefore, I'd like to come um, to the first one that actually um, uh, starts with the last topic presented in terms of not only having depicted this like strategic development within organizations, but also in the human workforce um, in terms of design thinking salaries. So um, Raphael has been posting a question in chat mm -hmm. that actually combines both, right? So the people um, that are doing design thinking within the organization, how would you describe them? Um, are they only doing this like as a kind of an internal consultant uh, or do they also have other roles? So the, the, the question, for example, then um, specifies around project portfolio manager who also advises uh, in a company um, on design thinking. So maybe what are your findings there in terms of like who is that within the organization? Mm -hmm. So maybe I do the start and then Daniele is, is adding more. And I think some parts were already answered by Dan, Daniele. Um, so I th so what we saw is in the past there were, were a dedicated job profile for let's say design thinking coach or something some expert um, level person inside the organization that is helping others to do the job um, mm -hmm. if you know scrum maybe like a scrum master and what we are currently seeing uh, in the field is that design thinking becomes more and more part of the entire DNA of an organization. And it means that other job profiles are also learning how to coach and how to, how to uh, translate design thinking knowledge in daily practices. So it's becoming, I wouldn't say uh, just a half-time job, it's not, but it's more combined with other expertise. Um, and that can be a product manager profile, it can be an R&D engineering profile, it can be a marketing specialist or a sales specialist. It doesn't matter who that person basically is in its um, core role, but uh, these roles are more and more taking over um, also knowledge bits and pieces of, of design thinking. And I think we see in very um, similar development happening with everything that's related to digital, right? In the past, we had a dedicated department on IT and now uh, marketing and many other disciplines are also becoming IT specialists and dig digital specialists. And I think it happens because it now gains track. Everything that um, Uli, Claudia were fighting for <laughs> the last 15 years is now taking place, right? So, so the method is, is not just a method, it's becoming something that's much more predominant in an organization and therefore um, uh, all the other departments and disciplines are taking over it and making it uh, their own. So from my personal point of view, it's a very positive uh, development that's happening. So Daniele, I'm not sure if you want to add something. Yeah, just to add on that, it was also interesting to see on the findings that uh, especially when you compare to the previous study that more and more companies, they are now interested in developing these in-house capacities. So they are willing and they are looking for ways to understand how to have this, as Falk said, this DNA in the organization that is tailored, that is customized to that particular experience. So it's more about how to develop these internal competencies and not just have like one the design and thinking role, but how to have this, this knowledge spread among different roles in-house. Yeah, well, maybe to add on this, uh, so there's also one chart in, in the study that reports clearly on it that in the past uh, organizations were highly um, 
uh, dependent on external consultancies um, to get all the knowledge in-house. Um, but now it's shifting dramatically towards in-house competencies. So, um, so, the, so activities like D-School, for example, they have helped to, to educate more and more and more people. And this is what we see nowadays in the study. So um, for sure, there is a good reason to have still external training facilities and, and, and consultants, but uh, more and more responsibilities are taking it over in-house. Hmm. Thanks for, for your answers. And I think also, I mean, this also resonates with us in, in terms of also what you have been describing is also the way we at least try to drive design thinking here at the HPI uh, or in particular at the HPI D school. So it's not just necessarily a toolkit uh, that can be used to uh, invent the next generation of products and services, but to be applied to internal challenges and then also design kind of the future of the organization. However, uh, that can be also difficult. So therefore, I'd like to uh, come back to uh, the, the one question in the chat that actually asks about like, how can I explain that? So now we talk about holistic approach, culture, and uh, how could we um, then, or could you like no, try to describe what this type of maybe design driven or design thinking driven culture is to people who have no clue about design thinking or don't know anything about it? And that's a question by Andre Moreskes from the chat. Oh, wow, Andre, uh, that's the $1 million question. What is the sales pitch for a design-driven organization? Yeah, so uh, it, it, it's a good question. So I'm, I'm sure you know what that means, um, but most probably I would work with analogies. I mean, uh, take a comparison between Apple and any other uh, computing device organization in, on the globe, right? Um, so then, then you would know what design driven means basically, uh, because it starts by anticipating what users need and want, what they perceive as relevant or not. And then starting the design and the engineering efforts from that singular finding, instead of putting the technology um, in the first place. And I still believe by, I'm a German, uh, by looking at Germany, this is what, what we do, for example, do most of the time still not, not, not well enough. We still talk entirely about technology instead of anticipating what we need. And just one excourse, everyone is now talking about sustainability and saving energy for many reasons. So not just sustainability, unfortunately, nowadays, but no one is really taught and everyone is talking about technology, right? With that technology, we can save energy and with that and with that. But no one is anticipating us as the most important part in that equation. So us as human beings, right? Because we are the cause <laughs> for energy consumption, right? And, and this is what a design-driven organization or a design-driven government would do differently, right? They would start with us. Right. And sure, um, with, with some of these things, it's inconvenient, but, um, but I think um, this, this is the, the main difference. Instead of thinking constantly only about technology, it starts with, with us as people. And then from there, we move on to the techn technological possibilities. Yeah. yeah, just to add on that, Andre, uh, one finding that we also got from the study was that one technique that the champions use often to explain what design thinking is and what a design-driven organization can be is by storytelling. It's really by sharing stories of what has worked in the past and why it worked. So really having this community that you can just share the story and engage them in this in storytelling to open the eyes and engage in, in the discussions of what could the organization become. That's really a nice answer. And I think, Andre, your volume is quite low. Um, oh, sorry about this. No, it's better, yeah. So basically, these stories are examples for entities that have to be designed and shaped, like what are, is our purpose? Uh, we have a lot of um, companies and uh, like you, I'm from university, we are, we are just doing things like we are doing them every time. So um, the story about why are we here or purpose is not properly designed. That could be a good point to start. 
shape stories about what is your purpose in this world. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, with this, um, uh, the session is not over yet, but we come to the formal end as it's now four o'clock. Um, so therefore, my colleague uh, Steffi will stop the recording. And